Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. For this episode, we're speaking to the well-known UK river angler, Paul Proctor, who you might recognize from his regular articles about wild brown trout in Trout and Salmon magazine. Paul is also going to be speaking at the Irish Spring Angling Fair at Adair Springs at the end of this month, which I'll also be emceeing at, and it's well worth checking out, so do go to adairsprings.com for more. Tom, you're obviously a lake angler, but you do fish rivers. Like, Is there much crossover in terms of tactics and technique, would you say? Yeah, hi, Dara. Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, primarily I'm a lock angler, uh, but I do, whenever I get a chance, uh, fish the rivers. Um, but uh, th- th- there's a... There is a fair crossover. Like there's naturally there's a lot of things that are completely different. But um, you know, like fish and dry fly, as we were discussing there earlier, uh, at the end of the day, you're co- covering a fish that's moving, taking a fly, and you've got to cover him and hope he takes your fly. Um so that said, yeah, there's a lot of differences that like we discussed it there, and it's very interesting to when we were talking there to Paul. Uh what happened to me was when I went to New Zealand for the first week that I was there. What really suffered with me was my accuracy. Uh, you can get away on the lake. I find that you can get away with the lake on the lake if you're just doing a lot of lock style wet fly fishing with just your accuracy doesn't have to be that pinpoint. If you're doing a lot of dry fly fishing and stalking on the lake, if you're doing a lot of nighttime mito fishing, uh, spent gnat fishing, canis fishing, yeah, you get honed in well then, and accuracy is really important. But um, I think what happened to me was when I went there, I hadn't been doing a lot of dry fly fishing. I was just doing a bit of wet fly fishing. So it took me a while. I, I duffed a lot of fish the first week I was there. I really did. And another thing as well, the rivers I fish here, when I go covering a fish on the dry fly here, I generally test distance and everything a couple of maybe a meter or so behind them. So I'm not spooking them. I know the fish is two meters ahead. So I can go behind them, judge the length and land, let's say two meters behind them and go, I have all the distance perfect now. Now I'm going to go up two meters and cover them. I tried that in New Zealand and I was two meters behind the first fish I covered and whoop, off he went. And I just went, what in the name of... So I tried on the next fish and the exact same thing. The clear water... They were so spooky. Yeah, they are spooky. And I was doing it in places that I didn't think were fished that often. But yeah, they were just really spooky. And so I realized, no, you get one chance there. And it was amazing that <laughs> Paul says it there because he discusses, you know, what's going through your head as you're about to cover this fish. <laughs> I realized, yeah, I'm going to get one chance at this fish. Maybe two, right? But you're not going to get more than that. So yeah, yeah, it was very interesting to hear him talk about that. Yeah. So is New Zealand like the Holy Grail, would you say, in terms of, you know, that kind of river fishing for wild brownies, you know, that there's a the size is brilliant. It's crystal clear waters. But like you said, you only get that one shot. Yeah, look, it's it's great. It's good. It's, you know, is it all as cracked up to be? Yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you it. Yeah, enough said. <laughs> yeah, I was there five weeks. I got a, um, I got a trout eight and a quarter pounds that I didn't fluff the first cast of them. Actually, to be honest, yeah, I thought I did. But funny, I was fishing a cicada, which is, if you want them, the, most, the, the worst flyers in the world. <laughs> they're like something from an airplane movie, right? They're, they're not designed to fly, right? So they just crash in. They crash into the river. They're, they're pathetic flyers, right? They're, they're terrestrial. And the fish just moved. And I, I would say I, was, I wasn't a full meter to the left of me. I was about a half a meter, even less in old terms. I was about a foot to the left. And I la- but it landed, not with a big plop. And I said, geez, I'm a bit out. But he, as soon as he saw the plop, he turned. And I'll never forget, I saw the white of his mouth. Uh, it's still going through my mind. Uh, it's just fantastic. But he was eight and a quarter pounds, right? Please tell me that was your personal best. My personal, um, no. Uh, <laughs> I had no oh, Jesus Christ. What, what was your best? First, the best is from Loch Melvin, 11 pounds. Oh, for yeah. God's sake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Best from the I'm, river, I'm then, wet was fly. it? <laughs> yeah, I've had an 11 pound brownie off Melvin a couple of years ago. Yeah. I've never seen the picture. Have you got yeah, the evidence? I've, I do. Oh, geez, I do. Yeah. I do. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've had, a, I've had one eight pounds off Corrib. 
on buzzer. But the whole thing about that one in New Zealand, it was, it was exactly what we said. We trekked in the night before. We did a walk up to a hut in a, a, a native uh, forest and spent overnight in the hut. Then we walked up the river and it was just it was just everything you want to do. It took us a whole nearly half day to walk out of it again to get where our jeeps were on a dirt track. Right. So it was just everything you um, everything you read about and thought about New Zealand. It's just yeah, it was, you know, they, they just the space down there and just everything. Yeah, it was it was brilliant. It was it was my once in a lifetime trip. I don't think I could handle it. Imagine you fluffed it. Yeah. You no, know, you spend the night in the tent, you spend half the day trekking up there. I, I fluffed probably a bigger fish on another river, actually, after that. But I I still don't know what I did wrong. But the fish, I know whether the presentation was too heavy. And it might have been a double figure fish that fish. Yeah. So yeah. Oh my God. And it was interesting, eight and a quarter pounds, and because I was with Ronan Crane out there. And you know, Ron's an eight and a quarter pound great fish, but he's been there so long. Like he's, I think he's had nearly a dozen double figure, double figure fish now at this stage. I don't at that, at that stage. I think he had eight or nine double figure fish. You know, so like, but as he said, eight yeah, and a quarter pound is good. Graph. And I was only there for a couple of weeks, five weeks. So yeah. yeah. I remember actually, I think it's Ken Whelan. I remember asking him before, like he was saying, yeah, about wild brown trout fish, and Ken, I remember him saying, yeah, New Zealand. That's the place, you yeah. know. So we should do an episode. We might catch up with Ron. Yeah, we should actually. Love to do that. Love to do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, he's a uh-huh. he's a fellow fellow Galway man. Yeah, he? yeah. Actually, it'd be great. Really good. He was fantastic out there. He really was. And actually, uh, one day we're, we were fishing. The first time I was fishing with them, I was just thinking about my accuracy. I was just watching him fishing. Oh, seriously, I, I just stood back and looked in awe. It was brilliant. I'm just unreal. Really fantastic. Uh, yeah, I could watch more. Eh? Like he said, go go for the next fish. I just went, nah, nah you, you, you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, you first. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I couldn't. Yeah. No, no, I had for a fish <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My arm's a bit sore. Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd love well to. Done. I'd love to do that. Ronan, if you're listening, get in touch with Tom. That's it. Yeah. He wants to talk. He wants to talk. All right. Let's get back to uh, this week's episode. Let's hear from Paul Proctor now as he talks about river tactics and how he got into wild brownies in the first place. Started on my journey in fly fishing, Tom, with wild brownies. And you go off on all kinds of tangents, as you know. But um, yeah, that, that, that's my first love and my passion is, is wild brown trout. And tell me this, Paul, was it mainly rivers you started off with and streams? I, I actually started off on wee streams close to home. In fact, the first stream I ever fished was one called Newlands Beck, just outside my hometown. Tiny wee thing and um, uh, graduated, if you want to call it that, Tom, when I was 14. But prior to that, we used to worm. I learned my trade, if you like, um, single sort of hook, worm, drill bullet, flinging it upstream into likely spots, you know, and trotting it back down. And then um, we used to see rising trout. And obviously, my parents aren't from a uh, fly fishing background, the, the farmers. So consequently, the, the, there was no information there. I mean, this is before the days of interblobby and things like that, you know. Um, and uh, I, I saw a program on fly fishing, thought I wanted to do that, convinced my parents to buy me a fly rod when I was 14. And sort of patched it together from there tom and here we are today but yeah cut my teeth on streams but was kind of seduced by the bright lights and big stock fish quickly thereafter you can you can imagine a 16 15 16 year old boy you know and guys are talking about cast catching monstrous rainbow trout regardless of if they were stocked or not and and i sort of got got seduced by that for a while and and that's good that that's really good i mean a, it gives you a different perspective on things and b i don't think you should have an opinion on anything unless you've been and gone and done it if, no if very true actually sense. yeah really true but it's funny because um we all got taken in by um well with me it was trout fishermen and the pictures of big rainbows mm. from the stock the stock mm. reservoirs so what was the closest reservoir to you my closest proper reservoir if you want to call it that is one you probably both heard of is stocks reservoir in lancashire 
Um, there's lots of little ones close to me. I'm, I'm quite lucky where I live, Tom, in that um, there's, a, there's a lot of hill towns and natural waters. I mean, I'm, I'm only 10 miles from Lake Windermere, for example, which is a natural wild brown trout fishery. Not, not as good as it was in its heyday, but we could say that about a lot of waters these days, couldn't we? Um, and then very, also, I'd love, I'd actually, if, if we had loads more time, I'd love to talk to you a bit about Windermere because it's, it's a lake that's always fascinated me. And I've always thought, yeah, well, you know, it's, a, it's, it's like something we'd have here. But uh, yeah, that, that's for another thing. But so you went to the reservoirs, but you, 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 you reverted back to the to wild brownies. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you know, you do this and, and I, I got heavily into it like you. You've seen the pictures and you, you want some of that naturally. And um, yeah, I had several years of, of, of doing that kind of fishing and very enjoyable. And I'd, I'd never even speak out against them. You hear people, I'm lucky where I live, Tom, probably like you guys have got natural wild brown trout fishing on my doorstep, but equally... Um, you, you can't get too sort of snobby about it and, and belittle them kind of fisheries because they're great and they're accessible for everybody. And as you know, on the, on the small ones, you, you've got sort of a captive audience of fish and consequently they get pretty bloody cute, don't they? You were saying there, there wasn't much fly fishing in your family. Like even in your area, was there a fly fishing history or culture or influences or was this something completely new to uh, yeah we, we had we had um local angling clubs yeah um so, so there was that but then be, being a youngster there wasn't necessarily all that information that everybody's got at the fingertips these days you know i mean a lot of it again digressing a wee bit you you look at the internet and, and things yeah, I, part of me feels envious of people starting out because they've got all that info but consequently you're missing out on a little bit of the journey of learning it the hard way and stumbling and falling off the bike kind of thing, you know. And what was the biggest kind of help for you? Like, was did somebody kind of take you under their wing and kind of show you the ropes? Um, not, not, not initially. Um, I, I uh, j just a bunch of like-minded friends. There was two or three of us, and we were mad keen. And you know what you like. It's... Um, you sort of egg each other on and we, we got heavily into it school friends um you know again going back there was no devices in them days no no um playstations so you entertained yourself going up the field and sort of terrorizing animals rabbits and things like that you know and um but 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 not too long after i was lucky enough to bump into bless him he's passed away now malcolm green and and malcolm took me under his wing somewhat along with Oliver Edwards, another name you'll be familiar with. So um, they, they, they sort of gave me a lot of help and advice and everything. So, so that was pretty good. But I pretty much learned my trade, I guess, like you guys, um, if you want to call it the hard way, um, by, by trial and error. Um, but the, the good side about that, yeah, it's, it's a long, slow learning curve. The good side is when, when you mess it up and make mistakes, you don't forget them, do you? <laughs> You know, they're, they're firmly imprinted on you. That's that's how you learn. Yeah, that's but, how you learn. By the sense of part, like you had maybe a bit like Tom, you kind of had that kind of outdoors childhood kind of growing up, was it? You're just spent kind of in the wild, in the countryside. And Absolutely. Off, do yeah, your own we, thing. Like. Yeah, we used to, at weekends, um, set out at 8 o'clock Saturday morning and bugger off and you don't come home until it's dark kind of thing, you know, uh, stuff like that, the good old days. You probably couldn't do it these days, could you? <laughs> well, I remember Tom. You were telling me, is it? Um, you were do you were out in the boat, Tom? At, was it the age of thirteen? Your dad trusted you even at that stage. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough. My dad actually got me a boat and engine to use myself on the lake when I was thirteen. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. I, you and I need to get together at some point, Tom. We'll have a good crack. <laughs> like yeah, talk, we will. talk about it. they wouldn't do that nowadays. <laughs> like you know, no. No, no, yes. no, you've got you've got to be licensed up to the hill and everything, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, you really could. Yeah, I just couldn't. And 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 firmly supported by my mother because she came from a fishing and water background as well. So I was lucky in that regard. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very lucky. Very, very lucky. lucky. So we're, we're, we always digress here, but just moving back. So we're just we were talking there earlier on and. You're big, you're big into dry fly, that I know. 
So yeah. this, this time of year, what are you looking for when you go on the river for dry fi? Well, we, we're, we're lucky, again, in my neck of the woods, I'm, I'm bigging it up. Everybody's going to be bloody um, making a beeline to, to north of England, Cumbria. We're lucky that several of rivers I fish, we've got March brown hatches. And obviously, and I know you guys get them over there, large darks. I'm not sure about the March brown for, for you guys. Um, but but th they're our sort of mainstay for spring. And, and they're there right now. In fact, we're just on the cusp. Of, of seeing the granum. I, I saw my first granum uh, three days ago and I look at my diaries, I keep pretty strict diaries. I've done for years on fishing. Um, and it's round about, if I can put a date on it, in that, for us it'd be the 17th of April when we expect to see granum getting into full swing. Um, so, would so you, if you keep good diaries, would you mark in each diary for each year when the first day you caught your first fish on yeah. the dry and, Absolutely. And it, that would make a very interesting graph, of course, if we went by year to year, for the earliest of them to the latest. But for example, what is the earliest? Well, usually our opening day is March 15th, and then invariably I walk around looking for rising fish. I mean, there comes a point, Tom, it might get to two o'clock in the afternoon. You, you've seen a flurry of olives, you haven't seen a fish, and you think, bugger me, I better knuckle down and get the nymphs out or something like that, <laughs> you know. Um, but do you? But do you? I, I <laughs> hand on heart, very rarely. I'm, and, and again, I don't want to sound like I've got my head up my bottom here saying that dry fly reels okay, because arguably nymphing is three dimensional as opposed to dry fly, which is two dimensional. I think nymphing is a lot harder, demands a greater work rate, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you could call me a lazy fisherman. I just wonder about consult the stubble occasionally. And, and, and look for rising fish. But that's what floats my boat. And I'm lucky that I've set my life up and invested my time in to be able to do that. I, I just, for me, it's the pinnacle, nothing beats. And especially if, there's, if it's a big trout, seeing that snout come up and eat that dry fly, it's just, as you will know, it's just sensational. You guys will know that. Paul, tell me this, what about wet fly? We did an interview, um... Uh, recently with this guy George McGrath real character he's on the river shore he's been fishing on the shore yeah. for 50 years and it was just interesting to hear you talk about Nils because yeah. again he'd be a dry fly man Tom wouldn't he be um, oh yeah and he kind of let that out in the interview just, he kind yeah, of very <laughs> subtle about it <laughs> but he <laughs> uh, but really interesting in terms of he hated the, anyone the nymphing right he would still do it but <laughs> his, his point on it though, I thought was an interesting one he says it's kind of Almost like it is more difficult than three dimensional. I agree with you on that, but it was almost he was saying it's like the kind of um, that kind of instant gratification of modern society. Go out, nymph, you know, get your fish, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. as opposed to yeah. dry fly, you have to wait around, you know, you have to kind of read the water and the fly, you know, it's it's a lot more kind of slower to it. Like, um, yeah, absolutely, and, uh, totally agree with that. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting just in terms of kind of, you know, the kind of nymphing and the kind of reflection of modern society. But George was also a spouse in wet fly in terms of it's kind of fallen out of favor. Uh, do, do you um, do much wet fly fishing as, uh, as well? Yeah, well, if you if you want to call it wet fly, as in uh, uh, spider fishing, I use a lot of spiders. I like my spiders. And yeah, I, I love it. It's a great, again, just, just on what Tom said when he pressed me, do you actually nymph? There'll be occasions like if the river's up a wee bit, carrying a bit of colour, it's maybe not the best conditions for dry fly. So consequently, or if there's no rising fish, a classic example would be a really breezy day. And boy, do we get a lot of wind in the north of England, as I guess you guys do over there in Ireland. You're on the same sort of uh, plane as us. And... Um, you, you get them them savage upstreamers that that lift lift the March brown duns and and uh, large darks off almost instantly. The wings harden and they're away, so they're not sat on the surface. And consequently, trout aren't rising. They're nabbing the uh, ascending nymphs and things like that. And you can't see the rises now because, as I like it, sometimes the river's like the blinking North Sea. You know, it's blowing that hard. There's bloody white caps and all sorts. And that, that for me is good, good sort of search tactics now. And I'll use a team of three spiders because you can sort of more effectively uh, search the water with, with a team of three rather than sort of, then your dry fly 
fishing tactics in terms of blind fishing or search fishing, it seems a bit puny. You know, you seem it's, it's you feel like you're casting into this massive abyss of, of, of or void of, of no fisher activity. Because again, just going back to what you said, Tom, my dry fly fishing, I, I don't target, I, I don't search water, I target rising fish. So I go around looking and revisiting pools up and down the river, try to find rising fish. Sounds all a bit specialist. And like I said, as though they've got my uh, head up my bottom, but it isn't like that. I, I, it, it just, it's what floats my boat. You know, it really does. I, I really think that's important. It, it's with all aspects of fly fishing. It's whatever you get out of it. You enjoy dry fly fishing, great. And, and a lot of other people do. And that's why it's good to talk to you. But like, you know, other people, you know, some people like the nymph fishing. We all take what we want out of fly fishing and enjoy it. And, you know, we're not harming anybody else. You know, that you want to you want to sit and target a fish. That's great. That's what, that's where you get your enjoyment from. But do you think part of it, though, Paul and Tom, is that, you know, when you think of the chalk streams and the whole dry fly versus nymphing debate that was going on in the Fly Fishers Club, that rightly or wrongly, a kind of bit of snobbery became attached to it, you know, and that's why kind of people went for or against it one way or the other. Like, uh, I, 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 I'll stick my neck out and say, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, you, you do wonder about them, guys. We, we, we'll never have an insight. We can look at the books and the history the legacy, which is which is fantastic, but you'll never know deep down what what kind of drove them. Was it was it uh, uh, to uh, to a lesser or greater degree a little bit of publication or you know because they claim not even bad publicity is 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 good, isn't it? In essence, and any publicity is 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 good. And these guys were having this this sort of open debate, so. Deep down, we'll we'll never never know. But I, in terms of snobbery, yeah, well, I'm a wee bit biased because I'm from the north. So as I call down south, um, forgive me, everyone, uh, south of England, I call it oity toity land, you know, because um, because because um, of the chalk streams. And again, that's that's a wee bit of me being jealous, I suppose, because they've got this clear water situation. I I just adore fishing for trout in clear water. It's a it's um, a sort of bad habit, for want of a better term, I picked up when, when I visited New Zealand a um, number of years ago and consequently went back every year because the, the clear water situation just gives you an insight to tr how trout interact and behave in relation to your efforts and your presentation and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we, we can all surmise what it might have been. What, was it snobbery or whatever? I guess there was a, a degree of that in it, you know, the nymph versus the dry fly. And like I say, I, I just want to make it clear. I, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm kind of stuck up or anything. It's, it's like Tom says, you get out of it what you want. And again, spider fishing, here's a weird one for you. you, you I'll often dry fly fish, dry fly fish, then I'll put the spiders on one, one, one day and all of, a, all of a sudden I'm back in love with spider fishing, you know. It's one of them kind of things that happens. You think, oh my God, I forgot how good and effective these were, and and things like that, you know. And you rekindle your sort of passion and drive for that that style of fishing. Yeah, it's good because uh, that can happen to a certain extent here on the on the locks as well. Like I would occasionally go back wet fly fishing after I'd been nymph fishing or dry fly fishing, and actually just really just enjoy it. I'm really just you know, for, as you say, you almost forget how good it is. You know? I know, and, and how effective. I used to, mm. uh, as a youngster, fish a lot more on Lake Windermere. We used to have a boat on there. I'm sure we, we'll get into discussion one day about that, Tom. Um, and um, same on Ullswater. And, and your staple was then, as a youngster, it was wet flies, you know, a team of three, your top dropper, your bob fly, and a couple of skinny wets behind it. And it, 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 I look back, it was so effective for, for covering water. And you know the name of the game when you're doing that is, is covering vast areas of water, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, it really is, yeah. And it brings it on. Um, Paul, I was just going to ask you, just to maybe kind of take it back, because I'm fascinated by the kind of the, uh, the kind of career trajectory of somebody who, you know, spends their life in fly fishing. Um how did you get, get involved? Like, was it a career path that you said, I want to be full time in fly fishing? Or how did you get into that side of it? I, I, I've never made a career decision in my life, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that kind of guy. It, it fell into place. Um, 
Yeah, I guess when you're a, a, a sort of fresh faced 16 year old, you, you kind of dream, wouldn't it be great to have a lifestyle like that or in the industry and things like that. But it, I, it came about essentially from, I, I used to tie flies professionally, um, um, still do to a degree, but just careful how many people I take on because otherwise you can find yourself chained to a fly vice for far too long and you lose that sort of um, creativity you have for designing or tying flies. When you, when you spill out, I used to tie for lath kill tackle and they want 500 mayflies. And I'll tell you, when you spill out 500 hooks on the bench, it's a bit demolarizing, you know, you're just looking at them and think, oh my God, I've got, I've got to tie a fly on every one of these. Um, but how it came about was tying flies professionally and, and a writer back then for Trout and Salmon was doing a, a feature in the Lake District on, on Esway actually. And he, he said, oh, look, sort of looked into it, Paul, you're local, can you tie me some flies for that? And I'll give you a plug in the magazine. So knocked him up some, some nymphs and buzzers and he went along and, and sadly on that day, they had horrible weather and struggled. But just shortly after that, about a week later, he left the magazine to go and write for another title but the photographer, they, they'd already invested something. And, and the editor, then editor, Sandy Leverton, um, said, uh, called me up, said, oh, Paul, you, you, you know what you're doing. I can tell by your flies, you know, blah, blah, blah. Would you like to go along? And I was all, oh, my God, you know. But anyway, I went along. Long story short, the, the fishing god smiled on us that day. We caught some tremendous fish. Then Sandy's back on the phone, would you like to write it? And I said, Sandy, I squandered most of my school days in the fields, snaring rabbits and things like that, you know. Uh, anyway, I had a go on it. Fair play to him. He said, look, it's, it's raw, but everything's there, you know. And, and that's how it started. And, and Sandy and an, another, his then deputy editor, John Wilshaw, somebody else who I've got to mention, he was very, very supportive. And, and they both sort of, you know, encouraged me and consequently, here we are today kind of thing. Um, but it, it definitely wasn't a career move. <laughs> you enjoy it, I'd say, though, Paul, I get it from the sense of the writing, you know, like it's it's a real passion that comes through in it. Like, And it, what I like about it is it gets that mix of kind of how to put the colourful side to it as well, you know, in terms of the flies and nature and, you yeah. know, and obviously great fishing. <laughs> Because yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, you're, you're reading the story and you know there's going to be a big fish at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. No, that's kind of you to say, say so. Thank you. I appreciate that because there's always a wee bit of self-doubt because I'm, I'm essentially not a trained writer or anything. So you always, you, here's one for you. I don't know whether to share this with, with your listeners and you guys. I, I never actually, when it comes out in print, I never look at it because I could look at it and pull it to bits thinking, Ooh, I could have structured that sentence differently and things like that. That, that might sound a, a, a tad weird, but that, that's just the way I am about it. You know, um, try to be a perfectionist as we all do. You know, when we're tying flies, we all want the, the, what we perceive to be the perfect fly. And we, we both know on especially you, Tom, we wet, the scruffier they are often the better. So you're not after this very neat profile of, say, a nymph or a buzzer or anything like that, you know. But, but we strive for that perfection. I think all fly fishers do. I think it's in our DNA to a greater or lesser degree. We all want to tie good flies. We all want to cast well, you know, need to say more kind of thing. That's, that's what it is, isn't it? Yeah, big time. Yeah, I think we all do. And casting well, you just mentioned it there, casting well, and New Zealand. Yeah. It, yeah, that's, uh, I've been fortunate enough to be in New Zealand. You mentioned it there. And I found for the first week I was there, my casting was not good enough. Now, it got luckily, it got good near the, as the trip went on. I was there for five weeks. But definitely, I um, it was something that really showed up with me. Probably been a stillwater angler as well, or a lock angler. You know, uh, I was a bit rusty on it, so I had to... I had to sharpen up on it, but you 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 go to New Zealand regularly now, don't you? I've I've, I've spent a lot of years and a lot of time in NZ. Um, you know, I've, I've been very lucky, and hopefully, we we'll, we'll, after this pandemic's cleared up, we'll, I'll be back there pr pretty soon. But um, in the well, the year, in fact, I was out there when COVID. I was in NZ when COVID was on the horizon. Obviously, we were all paying scant regard to it, but 
me more so than ever because you're not watching the news. You're out in the wilderness for three or four days at a time. You come back to civilization, scrub up, take a shower and things like that, you know, and have a day or two treating yourself to bar meals and you're back out in the wilderness kind of thing. And then from New Zealand, I, I actually went to, to Chile and went on to some remote part of Chile. And um, we, we actually had to catch a ferry off the mainland to go to, to some islands. And we went out there and spent two weeks in wilderness. We come back to the ferry and everybody's got masks on. I mean, it was bizarre. We j I just didn't have a freaking clue, you know. And we got back to the mainland and it was just unbelievable, unbelievable. And I just got the flat last flight out of Chile because uh, their president closed the borders that, that, that evening. You know, a friend and I, John Pepper, we'd been just camping, fishing, you know, off, off the radar kind of thing. It was sensational. But yeah, the New Zealand thing, uh, Tom, that to me, you, you, you've kind of hit the nail on the head in a roundabout way. It, again, there's a, there, there is a steep learning curve. Um, that them fish down there don't suffer fools. You've, you've, you've got to be on it. You know, you're going to get found out pretty quick. But that's part of the attraction. We all, we all mess fish up, we'll continue to. I mean, as I always say, my sort of one of my famous statements is, is when I slip in behind a big fish, what, what's the 1,000 ways I'm going to mess this one up and lose the fish? You know, because that's what's going through your head, isn't it? You think, oh, is it gonna eat? Will I cock up the strike? Will it? Will, will it lose it? Oh, there's there's a there's a some structure leaning into the river there. He's gonna make for that. Will he reach it? You know. So there's always this doubt in my head, thinking I'm gonna mess it up or lose the fish. You know. Thankfully, sometimes it comes <laughs> off. But but again, that's that that's part of the buzz is is that electric feeling of thinking, God, will it happen? Will it? You know. And and you know. And but yeah, New, New Zealand will it, it'll it'll bite you on the backside if you're not on your game, and that's a good thing. I think that's a good mm. thing. I, t I tell you, Paul, I think you're giving lesser uh, fly anglers hope <laughs> when they hear Paul Proctor saying he's worried about messing up for the big fish, like so. Well, it it, it happens, doesn't it? We, we we all do, and it'll come. And that's that's fishing, isn't it? I mean. Here's another one for you, just just off the top of my head, and, and you guys will nod. I know you'll nod knowingly at this. You go out and you're having a good run, and you your wee chest puffed out, and you can't put a foot wrong. Then suddenly you drop three or four fish, and if the good fish in a row, you've you've lost all that. You think, oh my god, what am I doing wrong? What's going wrong? You're double checking your hooks. Are they sharp enough? I don't like that hook. I'm taking that fly off and putting this one on. That flies bad luck. I don't like that hook. I've just lost too big. Do, do, does that happen in your heads? Because it does with me. I just don't get to the good bit stage. I just go straight to the bad <laughs> stage. <you know? laughs> Come here, Paul. Just, I just finally, um, you're coming over for the spring fly fair. That's going yeah, to be yeah, happening yeah. at Dare, at Dare Springs. Yeah. Just, have you fished yeah. much in Ireland at all? A wee bit. Um, when I used to come and demo tie flies for the locks agency many, many moons, moons ago. I fished a few rivers and rather embarrassingly, guys, I, I, I can't remember the names of them because we, we looked at six rivers in two days. It was a bit of a whistle stop tour kind of thing and try to absorb that. I could go back in my diaries and tell you mine. And um, that's the only fishing I've done. But, I, you know, it's a, it's a bit of an unexplored. It's a weird one for me. And, I, and I'd love to get my... my get over there because there's things i'd like to do the corrid thing yeah the mayfly's good but that that canish job that everybody's talking about that that that's intriguing me big time and i'd love to do some of the rivers uh, as well over there i'd really really like to sort of explore what you guys have got it's, it's a bit untapped i believe you know um and again i'll i'll do i'll do my typical if and when i get over there i'll probably fall in love with it and then be shouting and bawling how good it is and how come I've neglected it for this long kind of thing, you know? Just so you know, Paul, we don't tell anyone about the good spots, so we just have to, well, you know... Keep I know, it I don't expect anybody... I, I, don't, I don't keep it under the radar. I'm all for that. I'm all for that. <laughs> what good spots? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's not. It's no good. Don't come. Although I know, we know, I know a good guide on Carob. <laughs> yeah. Uh, apparently, yeah. 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 We'll get him on the show one night, Darren. 
so obviously just for anybody that's wondering um paul's coming over for the spring fly fair that's adair springs um adair fishery so go on to adairsprings.com for your tickets it's on uh, saturday 30th of april until sunday the 1st of may um paul you're going to be doing flight tying at it are you or what are you doing i'm, I'm principally more more um ca- casting i'm hoping to well i will i've, I've spoke with jason um and J- who's who's linked all this up for us guys as you know and He's, he's got me doing a slideshow, and I'm, I've got a couple in my bag, one about big trout, which hopefully will go down well, and one about insects and, and flies and relating all that. Not Again, not getting too stuffy about it, because I think we all get too stuffy about it and exact imitations, and I think the overriding factor is, is presentation at the end of the day. But very much looking forward. I've met Ned before. He's a great host. I was over in Ireland a couple of years ago, Ned was absolutely fantastic. Them boys are a, such a good laugh over there. The crack is, is, is just amazing. And why is it Guinness tastes so much better? It's time and place, isn't it? It's time and place. That's what it is. It's the company. <laughs> <laughs> the crack in the kill, as they say. The uh, yeah. Well, Paul, bring your rod over. You might get lucky yeah. when you come over, yeah. you know. Our listeners, people in Ireland, they know you well from Trout and Sound magazine. And... Um, I'm waiting for maybe next year, 2023, you can write about your Irish fly fishing trip. I think that would be the one to to read. That will be, definitely be the one to read, guys. (laughs) Paul, thanks a million for joining us. Hey, no, guys, look, thank you. Appreciate that. Great to speak with you. Okay. Thanks to Paul Proctor for joining us on the show. And don't forget to go to adairsprings.com for tickets and more information about the Irish Spring Fly Fair that's being held at the end of this month. Don't forget to rate, review and follow the Ireland on the Fly podcast on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. And plus you can keep up to date on irelandonthefly.com as well as on Instagram. And myself and Tom will be back with another episode about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland.